The following presentation is part of the Technology and the Corporation Conference Series, sponsored by MIT's Industrial Liaison Program. So I just changed the title of my talk because uh, I realized it was a little controversial yesterday during the poster presentation. Uh, there were people from Big Pharma who said that, you know, I don't think uh, I, I agree with you calling it as a problem. Uh, so good morning, one and all. Uh, as, as Cheryl introduced me, I'm a PhD student in chemical engineering. And those of you familiar with Greg Stephanopoulos' work, uh, it's predominantly in the field of metabolic engineering. Uh, so, you know, as is custom uh, for students from his lab, I need to present one slide on metabolic engineering. And uh, my thesis dealt with using this as a platform for natural product uh, manufacturing. And uh, the concept is, is, is very simple. What it is is that you have a, nat uh, a metabolic pathway that uh, you express and optimize its expression in a microbial host, such as E. coli. And then there's a, there's a lot of bioprocess optimization that goes in. And at the end of the day, since these are high-valued natural products, you're looking at titers. That's your, your defining trait. Uh, but the major input that goes into metabolic engineering is that you need to know the metabolic pathway. Uh, and if you don't know that, uh, that's, uh, it's a problem. You can't engineer this in these hosts. Uh, and that is a, a severe impediment for metabolic engineering. So this has restricted its ability uh, to only producing uh, natural products that are, uh, whose pathways are well known to us. So when I started off my PhD, uh, I was assigned a very simple uh, task. Uh, what was already achieved in our lab was the production of taxidine through the non-mevalonate pathway. So uh, essentially that is central metabolism. Then you have the non-mevalonate pathway that produces the uh, the precursors for a class of compounds known as the isoprenoids or the terpenoids, depending whether you're a, you're a plant biologist or a chemist, you prefer one term or the other. And then uh, the cyclization of this molecule, ger geronyl, geronyl pyrophosphate, gives you the first precursor to taxol, which is taxidine. So when I started my research, this was what was known to us, and it had been demonstrated. The titers achieved one, were one gram per liter. So I go into my advisor's office and he says, the task for your PhD, for you to graduate, is very simple. You have to take taxidine all the way up to taxol. And all that was known uh, to him at the time of the meeting is that there are multiple steps. So the task is simple. You find out all the genes, express them, and then hopefully produce taxol and graduate. Uh, but now the problem was is that uh, that is the structure of taxidine. And as you can see, that's the three-dimensional structure to show just how complex these molecules are. And, and just what I'm going to present is a numbering scheme for taxidine. So uh, I hope the video plays, but uh, in any case. Uh, so this was just meant to show. So what this video essentially was doing, it was spinning this molecule around and, and showing where the different labeled carbons are. So the most, so just to show the numbering scheme, uh, that, that moiety is, is this over here. So that is your 20 carbon, that's your four, that's your five. And as you can go numbering yourself around, you can see this is a 20 carbon structure. So a lot of uh, opportunities for having stereo centers in this molecule. And, and it is a structurally complex uh, molecule. But as I said, that multiple step, that one arrow that was told to, that I had to achieve to graduate, it happens that it's, it's quite difficult. And, and most people have not characterized the pathway to produce taxol. So the impediment for metabolic engineering that I talked about in the very first slide, that was a very real problem facing me to graduate, let alone produce taxol. So, that's taxidine. There are multiple steps. You're producing taxol. And as you can see, the difference between taxidine and taxol is that skeleton, which is known as the taxane skeleton, is retained. And all that is different is that you have a bunch of functionalities added onto the taxane skeleton. So the problem was we have taxidine being produced in the strain at one gram per liter. What's the next gene that I should express? Uh, Fortunately, since taxol was such an important molecule, uh, it's a an anti blockbuster anti-cancer drug, this was extremely well studied. And uh, the current route to produce taxol is it's a semi-synthetic process. Uh, you extract a precursor to taxol called 10 deacetyl from, uh, from the from its natural host, the yew trees. And then it's a four-step chemical process to produce taxol. So, uh, since they were extracting it from the plants, plant cell culture and, bi and the biotechnology revolution that coincided with these discoveries, uh, there was a lot of fermentation data that had been accumulated. So we were fortunate enough 
to know the, the structures of a lot of the metabolites in the pathway. And what was known about this pathway is that taxol is not the only taxin that is produced. They are in excess of 100 different taxol-like molecules, of which taxol is just one of this class of molecules called taxanes. And another important thing is that since they were studying these things, uh, there was a, a methyl jasmonate-based uh, elicitation of taxol production. Uh, there was a lot of uh, putative gene sequences associated with the pathway that had been characterized. But what exactly these genes did, uh, they were not known and they were not annotated. So all we had was metabolite data and gene sequence data. And uh, about two decades ago, there was the first, uh, the only so far cat catalog step after taxidine is the 5-alpha hydroxylation that takes place takes place over there. So that is the only step that is known in the pathway. So you go from taxidine to the 5-alpha uh, derivative, uh, the hydroxyl derivative, and then after that everything's a big mystery. And as I had shown in the structure of, of uh, taxidine in the numbering scheme, there are a bunch of uh, options in front of us. I could have expressed the 10-beta gene to get you the 10-beta the uh, product, product. I could then even express the 13. Uh, so what essentially is, is that we have 5-alpha, I could express a bunch of genes after. So as you can see, there are already three options presenting me, and then what after that? So this just becomes a very tedious combinatorial trial and error type experiment. And uh, just to summarize, there are different options in front of me. There could just be a hydroxylation reaction, there could even be esterification reactions after that. So if I were to go back to the lab and just devise an experimental scheme to experiment this, uh, I have all different sorts of reactions. And you know, I would basically take this substrate, test it out with a particular enzyme, see if I get product or not, and then keep repeating this step. And then eventually, the idea is that uh, you know, I would eventually uh, narrow out the map and get to the map of, uh, of taxane metabolism. But I have to graduate in five years. That's, that's the restriction. Right? So I can't keep trying and hitting in the dark, hoping for the best. Uh, so this was a very real problem facing me. So how many combinations could I try? Uh, me being an experimentalist, having an experimentalist background, uh, I mean, this seemed fun at the time, but then there's a lot of optimization that goes to ensuring the expression of these heterologous proteins in the host. So every single enzyme that I express, it has to be optimized, and I have to have these at least 10 to 15 different combinations, and there is no guarantee that these combinations would work out. Uh, and another very real problem with this, so then when I was presenting these ideas to my thesis committee, one of them suggested, well, why don't you just take all the genes that you know and express all 25 of them, or all 20, how many genes you know, express them in the host, and see what products you get, and then, you know, selectively knock one out, knock one off, and he was, uh, uh, this is, he was saying, well, this is, this is an op option you can try. But the problem that uh, a lot of people, uh, and perhaps he was not appreciating at the time, was that uh, a lot of these molecules, as you can see, uh, their molecular volumes are very similar. So if these were to fit inside active sites, uh, there is very little structural changes that are taking place. And uh, as is characteristic of a lot of, a lot of natural product pathways, Enzyme promiscuity to a substrate is a very real uh, phenomenon that takes place in these pathways. After all, these are part of the adaptive uh, immune system of plants, so it is in the benefit of the plants to synthesize as diverse range of molecules, so there is promiscuity inbuilt. It's evolutionarily favored in these enzymes. So we can't just throw in all 25 genes and then exp and expect to get the same product every single time. And then the issue, as I said, is promiscuity. So, you know, where do I stop the experiment? So these were problems that were facing us. But then, going back, reevaluating the problem, I realized that there's a lot of data available from fermentation. As I said, there was a lot of metabolite structures available. There was a lot of gene data available. So what we simply did is, instead of taking a bottom-up approach, we took a top-down approach. And, and what we did was, uh, was very similar, uh, was very simple. Uh, essentially, we went back, and these are all characterized data in the Reaxis database. We got the structures of all possible taxanes. We curated that list so that it was from a single source. Uh, and so we ended up having a list of about 128 unique taxanes naturally synthesized. And all what we started doing is that we just treated this as a big jigsaw puzzle. We knew that, we knew where it started off, which was taxidine over there. Over there. 
uh, we knew where it finished off, which was there. And then all we did is we used conditional probabilities to find out what is the likely sequence of steps that these substitutions would occur. And essentially, what this figure is trying to demonstrate is uh, we had to, this was an iterative process, because if you're just basing yourself purely on conditional probabilities, the very first try I did, uh, there were some false positives, so there were some confounding results. So then we added some, some more layers of information to this. We knew some of the enzymes that were, uh, that were active in the pathway, so we used the chemical mechanism information. Uh, so essentially what we had is was an iterative process until we narrowed ourselves down to the map of taxi and metabolism. We also had gene data. So now you get the map of taxi and metabolism. What are the genes that you express to get those things? So you have A goes to B goes to C. What are those arrows? And what we did is we had a lot of, we had the gene data. All we did is use tools that are used extensively by biochemists. We used homology modeling. Uh, we, we created models of the active site and we docked these different substrates that we had to create an energy landscape. So essentially we were finding the most favored enzyme substrate pairs to find the identities of these enzymes. And what we had, uh, just to show you what the pathway looks like, I mean there was another video here where I was flying through it, but uh, I think it's not, okay, so there it goes. It's, the video is not initializing. So essentially this was just a fly through of of what the pathway looks like. So it's highly branched. It was very different from what was stated in literature, which is the chemist-centric view of it being a linear pathway transitioning from A goes to B goes to C. Uh, this is highly branched. And, and what this pathway exhibited, which was very striking, was there was modularity of reactions in the pathway. So you had hydroxyl reactions confined to the earlier part of the pathway, where you get an activated intermediate, which is then esterified to varying degrees one of one branch which leads to taxol. So this is what we observed about the pathway. And what the, the computational biochemistry studies helped us identify was identify the identities of these different enzymes. So because a lot of these genes were not annotated in the pathway. So what we had to find out was which genes to which genes to express and what this process gave us it gave us a rough roadmap of what the pathway looks like and what are the likely sequences to express. So now we have a map that leads to taxol. Uh, so metabolic engineering of the pathway is now possible. That was the takeaway. But what we did observe, which was, which was uh, so one of my coworkers, he's a chemist, and, he, and I realized this being a chemical engineer, chemists have a very keen eye for, for things. And what he said is that instead of making taxol, you were having this highly hydroxylated intermediate, which he's, when we collaborated uh, with another chemist, you could easily convert that, that hydroxylated precursor to taxol using semi-synthetic approaches. But what the benefit he observed in this is that not just taxol, but you can convert it to a bunch of other taxol analogs. So now what you're doing is that you have a precursor that can give you a taxane library, which is a highly privileged chemical library for drug, drug discovery, which is different and, and arguably superior to libraries generated by combinatorial chemistry. So that was the idea, and so this is the idea that we have come up. Uh, we are currently experimentally validating this approach. So the map that I propose, we are, we are two steps down in our validation, and uh, we are, we are, the results look very promising so far. And uh, we are in, in. We should be publishing these results very shortly. And what I would like to conclude is the vision that we have for natural product farms, as, uh, as it says. So what you're using is you're using metabolic engineering as a source for highly privileged precursors that you can then functionalize using tools that are very well established in the pharma industry. Uh, you're just using esterification reactions, you know, reactions that have very favorable kinetics to generate a library of molecules that can then be screened to give you better drugs, again, not just cancer, but as well as other indications. Uh, so with that, uh, I may have run overboard, so I apologize for that. So uh, I would like to acknowledge my, uh, my advisor, uh, Greg Stephanopoulos. He's been very, uh, he's, he's, he's a fantastic mentor. He has you know, guided me through this. My coworker, uh, Ajit Kumar, he's the chemist who, who saw these ideas. And of course, I'd like to acknowledge the NIH and the Singapore-MIT Alliance for funding. Uh, thank you.